Yeah, well, the book is actually in, in three parts, as I say. The first part is a history of what I call utopian economics. And that's a history of free market economics, starting off with Adam Smith, what's in Adam Smith, what's not in Adam Smith, taking it through the development of sort of mathematical free market economics, general equilibrium <laughs> theory, then to Chicago and the two or three different Chicago schools, the original Chicago school of Milton Friedman and George Stigler, then through the sort of second generation Chicago school of Bob Lucas and the sort of whole rational expectations thing, and then the third generation sort of new classical economics, which is not exclusively Chicago because by then Chicago ideas had taken over the entire profession, and the efficient markets hypothesis. So I just give you a history of that trying to illuminate its strengths and its weaknesses. Then the second part of the book, I turn to what I call reality-based economics, and that's a history of what might broadly be called Keynesian economics. Um, I start off with Keynes, and then take you through sort of various forms of post-Keynesian economics, some relatively um, mainstream, like um, work done at, in Cambridge and Massachusetts at Harvard and MIT on sort of asymmetric information, things like that. Some of it more, more extremely heterodox, a sort of Hyman Minsky school, which um, never really got a hearing until recently. So I take you th through these various strands of what I call reality-based economics. The basis of that is that I think they're based on more realistic assumptions about the world than the free market model. So that's part two. And then in part three, I try to explain the financial crisis in terms of these rival views of the world because it seems to me that a lot of went wrong, what went wrong in policy and then ultimately in the markets themselves was a misapplication of uh, economic theories. In the book I try to explain how the markets fail basically and we you know if the long, there's a long history of market failure, study of market failure going back to AC Pigou another Cambridge professor, we're here in Cambridge, uh, who was one of Keynes's contemporaries, who came up with a lot of the ideas about externalities, how prices don't capture social costs, the need for Pigouvian taxes on polluters, things like that. That's got a lot of applications in things like global warming, even in finance. We now realize that banks create externalities. In a lot of ways, banks are like power stations, like nuclear power stations. You know, they perform useful function, but occasionally they blow up and cause a lot of trouble to everybody else. That's very like a nuclear power station. So if you think of it in terms of a Pigouvian problem, it actually helps you think about how you might tackle that. Pigou would say, well, these guys are creating externalities, we should tax them. So that the policymakers, after prevaricating for a year or two, are actually coming around to that. The, the uh, Obama administration has proposed this tax on banks, tax on bank balance sheets. Gordon Brown has taken it up and tried to turn it into a global initiative. That's uh, actually uh, an example of intellectual progress, I think, of how people have applied sort of more realistic economics to this problem and come up with a, what now seems an obvious solution, but a couple of years ago didn't seem obvious. It, there's an element of sort of a polemic and a manifesto in my book. It's not, it's not just a purely objective history. I mean, you know, I'm trying to call on economists and policymakers to adopt a more realistic approach to economics. Not necessarily get rid of markets. I don't think we should go back to sort of state socialism or anything like that. But just to have a, um, a sort of more realistic view of what markets can do and what markets can't do. To teach students, for example, about market failure, not just as an addendum at the end of a course, but as a sort of central part of economics. So you learn. Markets are very good at doing this, but they're very poor at doing this. And I think, you know, that would, it, it's, it's only radical because some parts of economics have got, have got so far away from that. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't see it as a radical agenda, but um, some elements of the economics profession do. Two, two issues. A, you've invested a hell of a lot of time and human capital in learning all these very complicated techniques, which you're then expected to teach the next generation of graduate students. That's what you're paid for. So you have a big financial incentive to stick with what you know. And B, obviously intellectually, you know, you've, you're just less flexible. You've 
you start to buy into this stuff if you uh, if you you know regurgitate it and study it for long enough. And um, you know, I think that there is a big question here: why, especially in the U.S., why why the economics profession for so long sort of rejected these ideas from dissident parts of recession and from from the, the profession and from outside the profession. And I think you know, there's several answers to it. One of which is this sort of internal structure of the subject that a lot of the sort of major journals and major departments had been captured by the sort of original wave of Chicago school and post-Chicago school and Minnesota school economists. So that was the way to get ahead to do that sort of economics. That's been a particular problem I think in macroeconomics because the sort of uh, ruling paradigm there which we now know, you know didn't include a financial sector for example you know, rule the roost for 10, 20 years. So that, that that's part of the problem. And then, you know, as I say, maybe there's a, I think there may be a, a sort of more fundamental problem in that economists aren't trained to think that independently. It's seen as a set of tools which you learn and then apply rather than a sort of independent thinking about the world, which is how I think economics used to be thought of, certainly when I was studying it, you know, 20, 25 years ago in Oxford. Um, it wasn't a matter of sort of learning settled truths, it was just here are some useful techniques which might make you, might help you to think about the world. The role of the state in the economy is a perennial question in economics. Towards the end of the 20th century it seemed to have been settled again in one direction, that the, or a lot of people thought that, that the less state intervention the better basically. The state's there to create a, create a social safety net, to enforce an inflation target, but you basically let the private sector deal with all production decisions. I think two things have happened, well three things have happened to bring that into question. One is the recession. We seem to have had a complete old-fashioned financial collapse caused by the private sector. Almost everybody agrees the problem originated in bad decisions taken by private sector companies, mainly financial ones. So that doesn't sit very well with the idea that the financial sector always gets things right. Second thing is we've had the rise of China and India, uh, which to some extent confirms the sort of free market drift of the post-communist era, because clearly they used a lot of free market policies. Uh, you know, building basically in China, basically building a capitalist on economy on top of the pre-existing communist one. They left the communist firms in. In, in existence, they didn't abolish them like they did in Russia, they just said, you guys can stay, but we're going to build a capitalist economy on top of that, and we're going to have some state direction, you know, through the export zones, etc. So it's a sort of hybrid model, I would say, between sort of Thatcherism and Stalinism, or whatever you want to call it. That raises questions, you know, about whether industrial policy can work, which, again, by the late 1990s, the consensus of opinion in the US in any way was that it doesn't work. Now people say, well, how do you fit China into that framework? And then the third set of questions which have been raised, and this may be more of an American view, is um, just some old-fashioned some old-fashioned market failures have re-emerged. Climate change, for example, is ultimately an example of market failure. The people who are emitting the pollutants are not internalizing the social costs. It's a classic case of sort of Pigouvian economics and market failure. Healthcare in the US, you know, we have an enormous healthcare system which emits 30, 40 million people. So there are, you know, these are just, and that's 15% of the economy, which doesn't seem to be behaving like a classic free market industry should. So I think if you take all those three things together, you know, you are getting a sort of, the pendulum is swinging back. Obviously, in the 1980s, the collapse of communism and Mrs. Thatcher and Reagan, pendulum swung very much to the right. I think, you know, now it's moving back towards the left. How far it will go, we'll see. I, you know, I, I don't think there's any chance of it swinging back to the sort of uh, consensus that you had in the post-war years, sort of 1945 onwards, that the, you know, the sort of mixed economy vision, certainly in Europe. Um, but maybe it will, I don't know. I don't have a strong view on it. But, but it just, things are a lot more flexible intellectually and sort of socially than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And I, I think that's a positive development.
traditionally, in the United States at least, journalists have almost played no role. The sort of history of uh, economic journalism in America is different to, to Britain, where I came from, obviously, uh, in Europe. In Britain, there is a long history of sort of hybrids, economists who are journalists, journalists who are economists, and the serious papers always had sort of serious economic correspondence and serious economic writing going back to, you know, Sam Britton, but also going right back to Keynes, who used to write for newspapers and magazines. Economists felt it incumbent in Britain to explain themselves to the laymen, and journalists felt it incumbent to try and really understand what the economists were saying. In the US, you don't really have that. The division of labor there is more stri has been more strict, perhaps because it was a much bigger economy, and you've had the academics in their world, the sort of economic and financial journalists in their world, and, and never the twain shall meet. So I, I sort of see my role as trying to bridge that divide a bit, because I am a journalist, I've been a journalist for 25 years, but I've also, I also consider myself an economist, I studied, I've studied economics at three or four different universities, I have a master's degree in it, and I've been writing about it in various forms for 20 years now. So, you know, I don't feel, I don't feel as if I have to uh, defer to professional economists. Uh, I defer to some of their technical expertise, but in terms of discussing their ideas and their applicability to the real world and policy, I feel perfectly confident in saying, you know, I think that's wrong, I think this is right, I think that's useful, I think that's not useful. So, you know, that, that, that's how I, I've always thought that, and it just so happens we've had this enormous financial crisis, so economic journalism and financial journalism is suddenly a sexy place to be. And, you know, that, that's fortunate for me, I just got lucky. You know, it's like covering, um, you know, it's like covering the military and war breaks out. Suddenly you're on the front pages. Um, so that's good. But, it, you know, I'd be writing about economics even if there wasn't an economic crisis. It's just what interests me. But it, it's, all these things have obviously got a lot more interesting in the last few years. <laughs>